to the Select Board meeting for Monday, August 5th, 2019. Would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. At this time, um, do we have any agenda additions or changes? One addition to the packet, uh, Aaron Martin from Public Works provided this. It will go with item 5C. It's a definition of the different road classifications from the state and the breakdown of mileage within the town. That's very helpful. Thank you. Please thank Aaron for us mm -hmm. for adding that in. Um, and I would like to make an agenda change. Um, in the reading file, file, item E, the memo regarding grant application for recovering, recovery housing at Fort Ethan Allen, I would like to move that item up to be business item 5G because um, I think there are some board members that have questions and I'd like us to have a discussion. Any other amended, uh, amendments for the agenda? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. Sorry. Um, uh, maybe this comes when we get to the consent agenda. If I've got a change to the minutes, does that come at that point? or We would make that change at that time. Okay. Thank you. Any other changes or questions regarding the agenda? I'll take a motion to amend. Uh, so moved. I do I have to do the full act? Do the full one. Don't That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All those in favor of the agenda as it has been I'll changed. A second. Excuse me, a second. Mm -hmm. I have a second. Thank you, Annie. All those in favor of approving the agenda as changed, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We have amended the agenda. Okay, now we're moving on to public to be heard. This is the part of the meeting where if you're in the audience and you would like to speak to the board about a particular topic that is not on the agenda, um, this would be the time for you to do that. So if you are somebody who has something to say that's not on the agenda, please let us know. Ma'am, please give us your name. I'm Shirley Pine, I live on Essex Highlands. I wasn't here for the dog discussion, but I am here to urge you to do everything possible to ensure the safety of responsible dog owners and their pets and to request that you revise the existing ordinance to give authority to the police department to fully enforce the ordinance with stronger repercussions for irresponsible dog owners. The current ordinance states that a waiver fee for our first offense is $25 per dog for dogs, quote, running at large. My experience is that the police department animal control officers are reluctant to issue tickets. First, a $25 fine doesn't seem to be a deterrent. And secondly, if the ticket isn't issued, it's a moot point. I live on a quiet, dead-end street that should be perfect for walking my dog. The problem is my neighbors choose to let their dogs run off leash, often with no person in sight. I would go as far as to say that they use the dogs to harass me. For a dog on leash, one or more loose dogs running at them can be frightening and dangerous. While some dogs may indeed be friendly to people, you never know how they're going to respond to another dog, which is a problem. More than one dog constitutes a pack, and the rules change as to their behavior, whether with other people, dogs, or anything else. As the person holding the leash, I don't want to deal with the unleashed dogs, and I don't feel that I should have to. I'm asking you, Please do whatever it takes to write an effective ordinance to protect responsible people and to do more than a wrist slap on the offenders. And then I, if I can have another minute, I have a, just my personal story is after repeated requests in person and on the phone asking my neighbors to keep their dogs on their property, I called animal control. This was several, probably 10, 11 years ago called animal control and was told that he would talk to them, but without a photo or him seeing the dogs running loose, he couldn't issue a ticket. I provided photos of two dogs in my front yard. The animal control officer opted to talk to them again instead of issuing a ticket. After numerous phone calls with no resolution, I gave up. The dog owners would pass me in their car as I was walking my dog, then let their dogs loose. It was very intentional, didn't feel safe, the advice I received from the animal control officer was 
use pepper spray if the dogs are bothering you. However, the owners continued to let their dogs loose, but not as frequently. This has been going on for the past 12 years. These same neighbors recently acquired two more dogs. And the problem continues. This time last month, when I asked the owner to grab his dogs, he told me they are just pups and made no attempt to secure them, even though they were in my dog's face and the dogs were growling. I explained to him that that's not how to introduce dogs. Last Friday, the same neighbor drove past another neighbor walking her three dogs. He decided to let four dogs loose while she was in front of his house. It created a dangerous situation for both her and her dogs. Then he screamed at her about being on his property, even though she was walking her dogs on the other side of the street. If you're able to offer a solution to this ongoing problem, I'd love to hear it. And I want to mention that I am another person who no longer takes my dog to Indian Brook. want to leave them with um, the board? Sure. Okay, why don't you feel free to hand those in. Thank you. We will be discussing the ordinance again in the near future, so you'd be welcome to come to that discussion because we'll actually be having the ordinance on the agenda that evening. <coughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who is here to speak on an item that's not on the agenda? All right. Thank you. Moving on, we have sometimes a really great part of our job that we get to do when we, have, when we have very generous residents who have opted to share their property with the town and the community at large. And we have a family like that here today. Um, the Unsworth family has donated um, an extremely large parcel of property that abuts Indian Brook um, to the town. So we have, they have worked with staff to um, make the transfer happen, and they were recognized at the State House for their generosity a couple months ago. I had the pleasure of joining them there with our state delegation, and they're here today. So we have uh, a resolution in appreciation of the Unsworth family. So Pat, would you do us the honors of reading the resolution? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the resolution in appreciation of the Unsworth family. Whereas Ray Unsworth owned approximately 224 acres on Indian Brook Road for many years, and whereas Ray Unsworth was an avid outdoorsman who loved skiing, hiking, hunting, and walking in the woods, and whereas Ray Unsworth gifted his land on Indian Brook Road to his four children, and whereas the land contains numerous natural resources, including prime wildlife habitat, wetlands, streams, and agricultural soils, and whereas the Unsworth family has long allowed hunters, loggers, neighbors, the Vermont Association of Snow Travelers, and others to recreate on the land, and whereas the Unsworth family subdivided the land to create several residential lots on 64 acres, and whereas the Unsworth family, wanting to see the remaining 164 acres conserved in perpetuity to protect the natural resources on the property and to allow for public enjoyment of the land, and whereas the Unsworth family donated the 164 acres to the town of Essex to be permanently preserved and named the Wright Unsworth parcel, and whereas the Wright Unsworth parcel abuts Indian Brook Park, which in turn connects to Winooski Valley Park District land in Essex and Colchester, thereby extending a massive swath of protected habitat and recreation land, now therefore be it resolved that the select board, on behalf of the citizens of the town of Essex, hereby extend our most sincere appreciation to the Unsworth family for their commitment to natural resource preservation and public open space with the generous donation of the right Unsworth parcel. We have a framed resolution to give to you and I think we'd all like to come over and shake your hand and thanks. And maybe get a cool picture like we did in uh, Montpellier. You guys are famous. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Right thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. We are so, so lucky to uh, 
to be able to receive this and to share it with the rest of the community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we want to have you three come and be in the center with your resolution? Sure. Well done. <laughs> you guys stood well. Thank you so okay. much. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you to the Unsworth family. Our next agenda item, um, excuse me. I think we have a oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Brad. No, it's okay. Please, okay. what can we do for you? <laughs> My name is Brad Kennison. I live on Bixby Hill Road. Um, you just recognized uh, the Unsworth for this wonderful piece of property that all of the rest of Essex residents have the opportunity to enjoy. My question for the select board, will you be placing the same um, restrictions on the Unsworth property that you're planning or proposing to place uh, Indian Brook Reservoir and Saxon Hill? Seeing as it's not actually part of Indian Brook Park and seeing as the, the history of the property has been to allow use, I don't, we don't have plans at the moment to do anything, so I... That's the question is, you know, will the it abuts Indian Brook Reservoir. You're, play, you're proposing to place restrictions on in, uh, hunting, which the legacy of the Unsworth, Ray Unsworth, was to keep the land open for right. all types of recreation, including hunting. Mm -hmm. So, will the select board be putting restrictions or right. on the Unsworth property? Sure. Staff has looked into it. There are no plans to put any firearms restrictions on the Unsworth property at this point. Um, it's still mostly an undeveloped parcel. It does not have the same recreational density or use as Indian Brook Park. Um, staff does not think it's appropriate to extend the restrictions onto the Unsworth property right now. I think the select board agrees. I can't speak in perpetuity, but <laughs> it's not part of the change right now. We're not Thank looking you. at that right now, Brad. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, interview and appointment. Brian Sheldon has expressed interest in becoming a member of the Economic Development Commission. Brian, would you join us at the mic, please? And I see we also have Greg Morgan, who is the chair of the Economic, Devel Economic Development Commission as well. Thanks for coming, Greg. So Brian, you want to join the EDC. Tell us why. Uh, look, I, I, um, this is my hometown. Um, I love this town. I, this is a reason I came back, right? And um, I want to make sure that it uh, continue, continues to grow. I think that, that um, that's the, and the, the best way that, that we can do that is to have more, have more businesses willing to come to, come to Essex, um, you know, whether they're from out of Vermont or whether they're from, you know, Colchester, Williston, and, uh, or Brattleboro. So, yeah. Board members, do you, any of you have questions for Brian? Uh, I don't have a question, but a comment, Brian. Your technical background is excellent. Um, so you. I think that your place on the Economic Development Commission, if we approve your joining it, um, it seems like you would bring quite a bit to the table in regards to you know, potentially luring or being able to present Essex as a, a location for you know, uh, where businesses can set up, where you know, remote workers can connect pretty easily to you know existing technical infrastructure that we have so I'm, yeah i'm very excited to Thank have you. gotten your resume as part of this packet and you know sort of gone over what you have in your background yeah thank you thank you um th thank you mr murray the my i think that um uh, my background and yours have a nice uh, cross-section yeah. right because one of the things that 
um, as a as a remote worker myself in this town, right? Um, that it, Essex is well positioned because we have some of the fastest broadband in the state, uh, but it's still not it's not world class though either. To be clear, right? So well, with your with your experience, um, you know, and mine, we can. I, I think that's something that we can we can work on with with, with Montpelier, right? That'd be great. Yeah. Yes. So. Ryan, you've attended uh, several EDC meetings. I have. And and you and I have talked just briefly before the meeting. Before, but and you've lived in several locations. I have, yes. I, uh, I'm, look, I'm I'm a software consultant by trade, right? So what that means is that um, I mean, what, you know, I get hired to do a project, and then I stay on. To, you know, usually what happens is I complete that project, and they ask me to stay and do another one. Uh, if that one's interesting, I stay. You know, if not, then I you know follow it to somewhere. You know, then I find another um, another project somewhere else. So yes, I have. You know, I've lived in in Washington, D.C., lived in Austin, lived in New York City, um, lived most recently in Chicago. So, um, so yeah, so I've seen a lot of places that are doing interesting economic development. And, you know, some of them are, some of them are, that are, um, you know, letting it go by the wayside, you know. So, you know, so I think that my perspective as, um, both, both from geographically and from, like, lots of different companies, right? I didn't run any of these companies, to be clear, you know, but, you know, I can see what, you know, I can see what, um, IBM was doing well and you know good and well when I worked for IBM 20 years ago, right? And I could see what startups that I worked with were doing good and well, um, you know. So I think just my diversity of experience, I think, so, will be useful. So what do you think about our situation and our bones? I, I mean, as, as I said, I, I was I actually got the map of the the broadband because that was something that was important to me as a remote worker and you know encouraging software developers. So I think we we do have good infrastructure by Vermont standards, right? Um, for that, number one. Um, I'm 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 curious as as a, as a, I'm also a member of the um, the Saxon Hill um, um, advisory committee. I'm not sure I may not have the, the name right. I apologize. Um, so one of the things that Greg and I have talked about is trying to because um, we have that as a great recreation resource. It's already a great industrial. Re it's a it's a good industrial resource. Um, but I think that we can we it would be we could if we could maybe tweak the zoning to do some things to capture some of the recreations that's coming in from outside Essex out there that would be great that maybe that maybe um, um, part of the vision within ETC next too so I'm not sure what the answer is there but I would like to try to you know work on work on that is that your question yes. so what economic development opportunities do you see that the town could partner with the village to accomplish uh, um, that's um that's an interesting question um, um, just because I, well, I didn't really think of it as a, I don't really think of it as a division that way. I, I mean, I'm, 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 um, when I played, when I, when I, um, when I played hockey for the, when I was a starting goalie for Essex High School, um, I didn't care whether someone was coming from the town or coming from the village, right? I didn't care which the defense, what, you know, where the people, the defensemen in front of me were from. I think we should work towards one big town, um, and not, um, and not fight over the, you know, resources in Saxon Hill versus the, you know, versus those, um, um, you know, resources in the village. You know, I don't think that's practical. So, so then, agreed. So then what would you leverage from the village? And just curious about con the kinds of conversations and, yeah. and, and changes that could occur that would lift both boats. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm sort of thinking off the cuff right now to answer your question. Um, but um, I think one of the things that's great about Essex is that we, ha is that we have everything here, right? So if what you, if what you, I, you know, I used to live in high-rise apartments in um, in um, New York and Chicago, right? So if you want that, we have that in Essex. If you want to live on a five-acre plot, you know, and have and and uh, and you know, grow something, you can do that in Essex too. So that the diversity of what we have to offer in Essex is um, is like a is a selling point. So um, maybe I don't know if this is specifically an economic development answer to your question, um, but um, but I think if I were recruiting software developers to come work for me in Essex, you know, then I would say, look, what, what are the things that you like to do, right? Do you you know like you know do you you know do you like to do you like to hike, you know, Saxon Hill, Indian, Indian you know, Indian Brook, right? Do you like to do you like to fish? Any Brook, right? You know, do you um, do you want to do you want to you know the the where do you want to live example that I gave? We have if you do you do you have kids? Do you not have kids, right? So if you have kids, we have great we have great schools, and I can tell you about my experiences at you know ADL and you know ADL Hiawatha High School. So you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm. I feel like I'm rambling. I don't know if I'm answering great. the question. It's great. Correct by your resume that you uh, came back to Essex in November this past November. That's right. Uh, and you've been a pretty steady face at our meetings, so it's nice that you 
came back and immediately became aware of us. That's all I have to say. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Watts? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, my mother calls me that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I see that you're, uh, you spent a few years as a professional triathlete. Just, just want, want, sure. want to uh, make, you know, just anything from that experience that... Uh, I, I, I mean, again, the, look, I learned to do triathlons here, you know, with, with Eric Bowker, I think you all know, he, um, you know, here in town. I mean, as, uh, as a, um, the, we have, um, it, if you want to be a triathlete, this is a great place to do it. Like, you know, you can, you can swim without getting run over by a boat in Indian Brook, right? You know, um, well, hopefully when, they, when um, the state finishes Route 15, it'll be beautiful to ride upon again, right? You know, um, this is not, um, many of the towns that I've lived in, well, other places that I've lived, you have to be, you have to um, sort of choose between living in the city center um, and being able to get out where it's, it's safer to ride on a two-lane road. You don't have to do that here, right? You can live in that apartment building at five corners, like the urban center of Essex Junction, right? And, um, and be on a safe road to ride, you know, um, I've had bad luck this week on Maple Street with those beautiful, with those beautiful um, um, bike lanes. So, yeah, I mean, I, th I mean, uh, yeah, I didn't, when I would say, if, if I was trying to recruit, um, you know, uh, triathletes to move here, then, then I could, then those are the things I would speak about. Now, now and to, to be clear, you know, you, you know that there's another professional triathlete who lives here, right? You, you know, Kim Loeffler, right? Oh. So, yeah, she's like, so, yeah, I'm not the fastest uh, triathlete in this town anymore. <laughs> so, no. Any other questions for Brian? So, um, Brian, thank you for coming and to answer, for answering our questions Thanks and for me. your interest in being willing to volunteer for our community. We really appreciate it. Um, at this time, we, the uh, agenda says we might want an executive session for the appointment of public officials. There are no other applicants for this position. Um, it's up to the board if you'd like to vote on whether or not to approve um, Brian's request to join the committee now, or we can wait and do it in executive session later, that is up to you all. Any preferences? I'm comfortable with going forward now. Okay. okay. Well then, why don't we take care of that now? Okay. Would anybody like to make a motion? Andy. I move that the select board appoint Brian Sheldon to the Economic Development Commission. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, you're an official Thank you. member. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Next item of business, it is the adoption of town road and bridge standards. Greg, would you walk us through? I will, and I'm filling in for a dentist tonight, so give me a break, but I am not nearly as proficient in the language. <laughs> Um, it's good because I was going to ask you to go very slowly. <laughs> I had a lot of new terminology thrown yes. at me yes. in this uh, packet. So yeah. Any, anything I can't answer, I can take back to Dennis and get you um, get you some answers. But he is on vacation uh, tonight. And just to, uh, I had asked Greg to give us all a list of the definitions of our road classes to remind me, and I didn't know if uh, Pat and Andy uh, Annie would have had that information yet. And in the back of this packet is an inventory of exactly how many miles we have of these kinds of roads. So it's very useful information. So thank you for providing that. Uh, so basically the, the state has updated its town road and bridge standards. Um, the Agency of Transportation and the Agency of Natural Resources combined to do that. Um, it was sent out to each municipality earlier this year. And it's a result of many discussions with um, many towns, including Essex, about the new standards. Uh, the town's public work standards, which were adopted a couple of years ago, they meet or exceed the new state standards. Um, but it's still recommended that you adopt the, the state standards. Um, doing so allows you to comply with uh, the standard set up by VTRANS. It's helpful for going after grant funding. Uh, it's also helpful in the event of a FEMA event, um, getting that ball rolling and, and starting to try to recoup some costs from, from storm damage. There is a little bit of complexity uh, with the class 4 road standards. These new standards introduce hydro hydrologically connected or non-hydrologically connected segments. Um, that's one definition that I'm not super, super up Is to that where on. one of the <laughs> things of confusion might be coming uh, in? Yeah, or? I mean, a, a definition. <laughs> that I mean, definition of hydrologically right, like, connected? I mean, I can parse out the Latin roots of that statement, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, knowing whether or not it's just 
the same stream runs along the roads and connects them, or if it's something more complex than that? It's, it's a little bit more complex. Annie Costandi lays it out pretty well um, in one of the attachments to the memo, but it's basically a few different standards. Um, if the road crosses a water or wetland, um, state water, so a stream of some sort, um, that's that's one instance. If it flows into a stream or wetland, um, runoff from the road, if it flows into there, it's hydrologically connected. And I think there was one other one that I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, but basically, if runoff from the road affects stormwater systems of some sort, or whether it's wetland, stream, um, something else, it's a hydrologically connected segment. It's not as simple as saying this entire road is hydrologically connected or this one is not. There's a lot of sections within those roads, and that's where it gets a little, a little confusing. Um, so you will be seeing, it's part of your reading file, and Dennis will, will speak to it uh, hopefully on the 19th, but creating some a town policy around how to handle those different sections. Um, but for, for right now, I think it's enough to know that the hydrologically, hydrologically connected segments um, set up under uh, Act 64, which is the state standard, um, do come into play, uh, and it's Dennis recommends that you accept it in part because that's sort of the FEMA event. It's, it's a lot of those instances where it's FEMA is going to get triggered if a road washes out or a culvert washes out because of that. So this speaks to that, and it, again, it gets you on the on the radar on the books for for FEMA going after FEMA um, uh, compensation. So Dennis and Aaron recommend um, whole public works department took a look at it and recommend that the standards do be adopted. Um, and it's one of those things where yesterday is the best time to do it, just in case we do have yeah, an event. Expired already. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I can try to answer any questions or take them back to Dennis if you have any. Just one comment is the screens oh, went into sure. screen savers. Just Good catch. Oh, whoops. Pat, did you have any questions? Um, yeah, I mean, going through all the documentation that we got as part of our packet, I did see that there was some back and forth um, in emails that Dennis sent to the state, um, specifically around Class 4 roads and whether or not FEMA grants would apply to those. Mm -hmm. um, and the packet said that it seems like it's unclear at this point, or at least that there is... It, uh, could you talk a little bit about that so I'm sure that I'm understanding it, like... Does Vermont say that we need to, like, adopt those standards? But, like, does that mean that we are or are not then required to maintain those roads? Or, set, like, you know, again, like, just the back and forth of it. I, I thought I followed it, but I want to be sure that I know kind of what position we're in if a Class 4 road does wash out. You know, are, we, are some homeowners going to come to us and say, you've maintained the ditch on the side of this class four road for the last five years. So now you have to replace the whole thing. Like, is that what's going on here or? The way I read it, and I think Dennis will be able to speak to this in more depth in a couple weeks. Um, I can try to get you an answer before then. But the way I understand it is basically, it's unclear and the state doesn't quite know what FEMA is gonna do. Um, but the recommendation from from our staff after speaking to the state is that we, we do accept these standards we do them for the majority of, or the entirety of the class four roads um, because it's going to be really hard to come back and say, well, resident A, you were part of a hydrologically connected section, so you're covered. Resident B, I know you're 200 yards down the road, but you're not on that hydrologically connected section, so you're out of luck. Um, so their recommendation is to do it for the entire road so that we don't have to run into those issues. So a couple of the memos in the packet talked about various segments of different streets and I'm just wondering some were identified as fully complying with um, standards and some of them need some work are these going to be additional pro uh, projects that are added to the list of projects that we already have or did we already know that these segments needed attention that I do not know just wondering if there'll be an additional cost not one, that we have anything that we can do about that. One <laughs> could imagine that if there are costs, they will be spread out over time mm -hmm. to address in, in a prioritized way. Okay. Anybody else have any questions about this? So what you need from us is to 
I'll hold on and getting back to the top of the memo. So we're you're asking us to adopt the new road and bridge standards. Correct. And then to sign off, which I have here, on the standards. Andy? I move that the select board adopt the new road and bridge standards as completed and recommended by staff and sign the standards. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in oh, excuse all those I apologize. Before we continue to vote, we had a resident who had asked me if she could speak on the topic. So I'd like to do that before we finish up. Ma'am, yeah. sorry, I've, I've almost no, overlooked I, you. I want to speak about the, um, the new policy. Could but you state your name? Lisa LaVerge. Thank you. I do know um, that I've spoken to FEMA um, because West Sleepy Hollow Road did wash out and the residents had to pay like $45,000 out of their pocket. And <laughs> Dennis contacted Robert Bancroft, who's come to a couple meetings for us. <laughs> who said that the agreement with the uh, State Department of Transportation and FEMA did not go through. So unless the town maintains the Class 4 road, FEMA will not kick in and pay for emergency services, uh, is what I understand that to be. Um, and that's been the past. So in the past, FEMA did not give the residents any money uh, because the town doesn't maintain the Class 4 road. Okay, and thank so you. That's not great understood for everybody on the road um, the other thing is I've requested that they do another review of the hydraulically connected segments for the road uh, it wasn't done 2017 it was done like four years ago I'm getting an exact date I don't have it but there's actually been erosion on the road and the culverts worn out um, that aren't in sections that are considered hydrologically connected um, and so speaking to um, I think it was Fitzpatrick's engineering services and the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission did the study and um, you know I've let them know that there's been erosion and there's a development that's filled the ditches with sediment right now and I don't know if they will do another review of the road um, because it's clearly not to the standards that it was like three or four years ago um, but that might happen I think if you sign this you'll just they'll automatically be included if they add additional sections of the road Okay, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Okay, any further comment? Yeah, if uh, Lisa, if I have a question, if you don't mind, uh, when this when the road washout happened for you, was that during the Hurricane Irene yes, stuff? Was. Okay, it was just I just want to make it clear that you know there's instances where there are real you know real world scenarios that this is and only, and you know, only potentially happening. Some numbers of the road. Thank you. Andy. So, sorry, now that we've started discussion, no, prompted fine. the question, do we need to change our ordinance to comport with this? Is that what comes next, or is it? That's, what's, that's what comes next. Um, I don't think you need to change your entire ordinance. I think you just need to create a policy to clarify what is in the ordinance. Okay. Okay. And is the beginnings of that what's mm -hmm. in the reading file today? Yes. So, no okay. So, that means you'll be coming back to us in an upcoming meeting with a new revised policy for us to approve. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's try that again. We have, a motion, we, have a we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. Next item of business designate a local leader to participate in the second annual Vermont Community Leadership Summit. Greg? So the Vermont Council on Rural Development, uh, last year they started um, the first annual Vermont Community Leadership Summit. Um, I, I attended last year, thank you, you nominated me as the, the local leader and it was absolutely worthwhile. Uh, we sent a few other people as well. Uh, There's that went last year. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in that available. So. Okay. All right. Um, do you need a motion from us on this? To, yes. to nominate Caitlin, please. To nominate Caitlin. Okay. So would anyone like to make an, a motion to nominate Caitlin Corliss? My wife's a library trustee, so to avoid conflict of interest. Potential appearance of conflict of interest, I won't be nominating, but I will be voting. 
That sounds like a safe stance to take. Would Pat or Annie like to nominate? Um, <laughs> I move that this select board designate uh, Caitlin Corliss as Essex's, Essex's local leader for the second annual Vermont Community Leadership Summit. I second. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. I look forward to seeing Caitlin there. Next item of business update from the governance subcommittee. Since Max is not with us today, Andy, would you be willing oh, to do that? Oh, I have to do it. <laughs> uh, if you don't want to, we can always defer to Greg. <laughs> no, no, no. So we, we met again and again. And uh, discussion, the uh, most recent discussion was mostly about the discussion guide for the upcoming focus groups. Um, I think the intent was that that would be finalized, like, was it today? Greg, or is it end of this week? Um, the focus groups, the, it's open until Wednesday. But I mean, the, the oh, discussion, the discussion guide, guide. Yeah, that's, that's been sent it's off. Been that's approved. Been so we, we, we made our comments to it and we allowed staff to do right. the final approval on it after the edits were made that we um, asked for. Um, I think it went out Friday. And then, um, uh, looks like more than 50 people have signed up to be on focus groups. Um, um, I did get a question about whether the uh, governance subcommittee would be selecting the, uh, the, the participants, and we've told KSV that we don't even want to see the list, and so um, that will be done independently by them. Um, they'll only feed us the, uh, the results afterwards, and they'll even read the intent is they, well, they will redact uh, names from the transcript. Uh, before they give us the the transcripts as well so that we don't try to guess who who said what because he will be calling on people by name in the meeting um, so that's underway we also looked at some uh, infographics to be used to stimulate the conversation so that there's some uh, we laid out the options for governance um, provided some definitions and those sort of things so that the, the, there's a common ground to, to talk about when they have their discussion groups that was included in the packets. Um, what else? That's about That's it. About um, if anybody still is interested in the focus groups, uh, there's a survey available until Wednesday for people who are interested in signing up. Um, I think you can find it at uh, www greateressex2020.org. Andy, can you confirm how many focus groups are, are there going to be altogether? Uh, it's my, there's going to be six of them. There are going to be two that are uh, village only, two that are outside the village that will include both 8-1 uh, and 8-3 uh, participants so that we're getting that uh, uh, both the more and less rural uh, parts of uh, outside of the village and then there's going to there will be two focus groups that are mixed with village and outside the village Thanks. Annie did you have a question um, I don't know if it's uh, doable or possible but um, when I subbed for Max being out of town on Friday morning I noticed that um, Ken had so kindly uh, videotaped the subcommittee meeting and I don't know if it's um, in our budget are allowable to have Channel 17 at the subcommittee meetings or not. I just thought I'd mention it. I don't really, I'm venturing into waters I don't know about. We can reach out to Channel 17. I believe that both Essex and Essex Junction are at their full quota uh -huh. of meetings that they record each month for what we pay for. Yeah. And we probably would have to hire them extra, but I'd be happy to inquire and find out what that fee would be. Um, but at the moment, they're not being recorded, as you know. <laughs> Our next meeting is uh, the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And then the two meetings after that are uh, September 5th at 8 a.m. and October 17th at 8 a.m. What, what time was the August 22nd? It's 6.30 p.m. Are you anticipating meetings in between those dates or? Uh, only if necessary, but I don't think so. We don't know. There's no. Those 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 coincide with some of the checkpoints from KSV. Got it. So okay. yeah, yeah. 
Greg, did you, were you going to add something? That's what I was going to say. Okay. (laughs) Your mind. Okay. Um, All right. So this sort of leads right into item number uh, 5F, approving the use of the infographic about potential merger. Greg? Um, So as Andy mentioned, when the governance subcommittee met on Friday, uh, staff had had pulled together a few infographics um, available for for the focus groups. It was looking at uh, the potential governance options. It was just a short bullet pointed um, item of the different different proposals and some also some more graphic representations of uh, the different proposals and representation issues. Um, We did not have this Greater Essex 2020 answering your questions about the November 2020 merger vote. It was not available for the governance subcommittee meeting, but um, we put what is pretty close to a final draft together uh, shortly thereafter because the governance subcommittee had voted to approve some um, the use of those other informational materials in the upcoming focus groups. Uh, We wanted to get approval from the boards before we added anything else to the focus groups. Um, so I wanted to give you a chance today to, to look at this two-page sheet. Um, it, it's a fair amount of information on the couple pages, but trying to provide a lot of, a lot of information, complex information, into a fairly digestible uh, piece of paper that can be handed out at the focus groups. Um, it'll be a chance to get some feedback on the infographic at that time as well and tweak it accordingly as we go forward. But it speaks about... Um, the upcoming vote on November 2020, uh, what the vote is about, um, some information about potential benefits, uh, questions to still be answered that we'll have to they'll have to consider as we go forward. Speaks to a little bit to how the town and the village, town of Essex and village of Essex Junction governments function today. And then on the second page, there's a timeline about um, where we started in uh, June of 2019 this year with focus groups and kind of moving forward, looking at the November 3rd, 2020 vote with um, expected uh, events and and timelines and dates along the way. Any comments or questions for Greg? Andy. There's a little paper clip thingy that says what's a charter um, on the first page. And um, it says that it's a legal document that establishes a municipality and most Vermont towns don't actually have a charter. So I'm, but they do exist. So that I'm, just, I'm just concerned that that's a little misleading to say that you have to have a charter in order to be a municipality. Um, I don't have suggested suggested other words to use, but um, I mean the Vermont statute establishes. I mean, it tells you how how you, what you need to do to run a town. You need a select board of three members. Um, but most towns don't have charters. I'd like to make a comment yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. Most towns don't have charters, but the village and the town of Essex do, and so it's. You know, it's explaining what a charter is because they each have one. So I, I don't see this as misleading people that some towns don't have charters and an assumption that all towns do. I just see it as defining something that we have two of. So, and just a counter to your observation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg. We, staff can take a look at it and see if there's a word or two of um, charter as a legal document uh, that can be used to establish a municipality and, and has been used in Essex and Essex Junction, something to that effect. Any other questions or comments? Andy? Um, under the key benefits, there's a, an item that says reducing the number of times residents vote. Um, I'm concerned about having that in there because that's it's, it's only one vote that would be eliminated by specifically by the merger that would be a village annual meeting we still vote on the same all the same other days um, so I'm, I'm it only you know the the number of votes reduced it only affects people that live in the village and it's only by one so I'm, I'm not sure that that's really a key Thing. It didn't. It certainly didn't come up as an issue in the survey that we just ran either. Um, 
so I'm I'm not sure. And I understand that there there are other possibilities for things that can be done to reduce the vote, but they're not don't necessarily have anything to do with the merger. You know, merging the village and the town will not. What? You so might just. I like just cut out. Bounding on the table too much. No, no, it just kind of. Are you hearing it? Scott? Okay. Yeah. Everything's good. Oh, it just sounded like your mic completely died. So. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, not your fault. Uh, 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 totally derailed me here. So Did anyway, so so I understand. So so merging merging the town and the village won't change when the school that the, you know has no effect on when the school votes are. That's a that can be a com that's a completely independent effort to talk to the school district right. to say can you move your budgeting process so that your vote happens on a a different day that coincides with another vote that we're already doing that's has nothing that that really isn't a merger d discussion it can be something that happens in parallel it, it can be something that happened if we don't merge and so I, I, I'm just reluctant to have that in there as a a key benefit okay I'm talking too much. No, not at all. No, what happened while you were talking is that I had a thought, and then I think you answered it. And, and I, unfortunately for you, I, I moved and, and caught Eileen's eye. I'm sorry about it. Oh, so you don't have a question? No, I feel like Andy um, talked it through very well and got him and got to what I was thinking of. I'm sorry, Andy. Okay, so I disagree with that um, calculation, and I, I want to take a minute to um, explain why I disagree. So village residents vote five times a year. They vote at town annual meeting on the budget, mm -hmm. town elections the next day, village annual meeting on the village budget, mm -hmm. village elections a week later along with the school board, mm -hmm. and then the national elections in November. Town residents vote at town annual meeting, town elections, school board elections, and November elections. So village five, town four. Mm -hmm. If we were to merge, and have one budget, we would conceivably be eliminating the village annual meeting, which is a voting opportunity, and the village elections, which happen a week later. So that's two votings, even though we are, we still vote on school board elections at the same time, but we are eliminating two votes for the village. The, there is a potential to reduce the number further, which is the school board leadership has expressed interest in aligning their voting with the towns, whatever it is we end up doing as a merged community. So there's the potential to reduce it further. And then um, finally, there's also the potential that if the residents decide based on a merger plan that includes this option to do Australian ballot for our voting and not have town meeting at all, but just do everything elections of officers and the approval of the budget in Australian ballot, then we would reduce the number of voting times even more to the point where village residents would vote twice and town residents would vote twice. We all just vote twice. One day for town budget, elections, and school board, and one day in November for national and state. So I, it will change the number of times that residents vote. It might be more specific to say village residents but it does change the number of times we go. So, Pat, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, at some point, I, I did think that this was going to come up. So we did have time that I asked for on the agenda at a school board meeting to discuss it, um, to get a sense for that full board, um, whether there would be uh, an approval that if the town merger did indeed reduce votes, if the school district would be willing to then follow suit. Um, and the answer was yes. So in an official capacity, the school district and the school district board is not just signaling, you know, a willingness to talk about, but, uh, you know, a, a strong interest in consolidating the number of votes further by putting those onto, you know, a, a common day if this happens and you know that's that's contained within our minutes from previous meetings so and it's, it's subject to change yeah it's not like me coming here and saying you know in my opinion i think the school board probably will it's that we've had a discussion about it and we've said you know this is something we're interested in this is something we want to do we want to reduce the number of individual voting days because by the time school board comes around that's number five in right. the voting cycle annie so if I'm understanding Petra correctly, 
it could be potentially not something that we could say in this moment here. But conceptually, what I understand from Patrick as a concept is that we could be looking at a situation whereby it could be that the school board would say, if the merger vote goes through, then this. That could be. I understand that that's not to do with Andy's. Right. It's nothing we no, can do anything but about. But I'm just, th- I'm just make, I'm just, I'm just explaining back what I'm hearing to ensure that I understand it. Do I understand correctly? Great. Thank you. So are we then ruling out the possibility of the discussion that folks have brought forward with regard to the, the hybrid voting system where the final budget vote would be on that same day that we now do the school budget voting? I'm not at all saying that. That's, so that, for the that, that's why I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm very concerned about saying we're going to reduce votes by going down to two if it, you know, because we're, 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 we're then today, by putting this, these words in here and the discussion that we just had saying that we're not going to consider hybrid voting because that would have then requires to have that middle of April vote that we still have today. So the, the line on the, on the uh, flyer says reducing the number of times residents vote. It doesn't say reducing the number of times residents vote by two or three or four. And we are not talking at all about whether to adopt that hybrid voting pr- uh, recommendation that the Essex Governance Group made. That's not the point of this conversation at all. So th- I'm sure the governance subcommittee will discuss that at great length, and there will be a lot of public participation about what kind of voting to do. All we're talking about here is whether or not to include the phrase reducing the number of times residents vote. To me, it's not so specific that it's inaccurate. But it's only specific to people who live in the village. So if, if that's the case, and we're going to they include, are residents. And we're gonna, yeah. So then let's let's add in let's add in the key benefit that municipal taxes will go down in the village. No, because we don't know that. We haven't done the math yet. We're working on the math. We can't make assumptions like that. We can make this assumption because we know at least one vote will go away. I think we're both parting hairs here, and I don't think this is an argument worthy of the time we're spending on it. Okay. That's, that's just my position. Okay. Annie, did you have your hand I, up? I, I did. I, he, I hear and, Andy very well. Um, but I think just conceptually that any number, even one, even for half, the population, which it just about is, right? It feels beneficial and intelligent to me to leave it there, but um, I I hear you, Andy, but I feel comfortable with it being there, and I feel comfortable that it's something that just gives people pause for thought and for a further conversation, which is, which is what this is all about, is thought and further conversation. I would also add that when the select board and the trustees accepted the recommendations of the Essex Governance Group, among those recommendations was a commitment to, re- to have same-day voting. This is, in my opinion, a step toward that, right. and it's not dictating what it's going to be, but it's my assumption, based on that acceptance of that recommendation, that both boards are committed to doing what we can to reduce the number of times our residents vote, to increase the convenience and increase the participation. So, but Andy, it's you. It's clear you disagree, and that's fine. We're just discussing yeah. this. If we're, gonna, if we're going to include things that only benefit people specifically in the in the village, then I I don't agree with this. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments about this infographic? Yeah. I, we'll be with you in a moment. Thank you, Annie. Um. Oh, I forgot to say, this is really nice. Good job. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the regional, well, regional Planning Commission has a really talented person. I'm, I'm very sorry that I didn't say that part because it's, uh, you know, it, it, that's a lot of things to have to put forth in a style such as this. So I, I'm very embarrassed and ashamed that that wasn't the first thing that I said. <laughs> 
<laughs> while we're picking apart. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's beautiful. Um, I know for a fact that there are some people very concerned about the word taxation and where it's located. Um, I see personally that the I, the foundational work is so intelligent. It's got a very equalized situation for previous merger attempts. The heart and soul of Essex, which was so valuable. The shared service delivery model, the Essex governing, governance group, and thoughtful growth in action. I see that as being very intelligent and very appropriate foundational work. Um, sandwiching that, and very importantly so, I see the words public engagement, resident surveys, legal guidance, taxation, governing board structure and elections, and community identity. I wonder if it might not be a good idea. It seems to me it's kind of an order of how we need to go, and I don't know if we want to rearrange that in any way to alleviate some concerns or just feel confident that all the information is there. That's what I want to say. It took me a really long time to get to that. I'm very sorry. Anybody else have some thoughts about that? I think um, I had participated in some of the editing of this. They, um, Anne and um, Evan and Greg asked for some input. And um, there was definitely not any intentional sandwiching of that no by sandwich I meant it well I, I meant I meant that those important features were supporting right I didn't mean sandwich bad I meant that that was very useful supportive sure and I bread's appreciate, important I appreciate that <laughs> but uh, what I'm trying to say is that the paragraph below the wheel yes is unrelated to the paragraph up to the wheel it, it's saying these are the foundational things oh, that we bad. did and then the next paragraph is and here's some more stuff we uh, still need uh, to deal uh, with uh, and then taxation, governing board structure, and elections, community identity are the three biggies that we still need to deal with. Well, this is the thing. I think the fact that it's big is not apparent in the graphics. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry. Even longer it took than I thought. I would have to, if the rest of the group agrees and wants to make that change, we would have to leave it up to the graphic designer to sure. figure out a way to make it look bigger. Sure. Um, not larger, just with more prominent value. yes i i get how some people might feel like the word taxation is in small print on the lower left corner of the document making it look like we're trying to hide it or something um in my opinion looking at that list it's the number one thing on the list reading left to right sure. so um we could probably ask um greg please i can i can reach out to um the regional planning commission emma vaughn and and see if we can do a box or a different color sure. to call it out just to make it stand out a little bit different if, oh, she, has, if she has any ideas yeah that section make it more prominent and then the way elaine just spoke about it that it's obvious that taxation is the first on the list of things and maybe that will make people feel more confident in and that's what i'm looking for i'm looking to make sure that that everyone feels confident that we're here to listen to find out learn study grow and then vote. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for hearing me. No problem. Thanks, Greg. Pat, do you have any other comments or Andy? I mean, my only comment on this is that I, I think this is, I've not criticized us before, but made note of the fact that I think that sometimes we get too in the weeds yes. about certain things. This is an infographic that's being used in a focus group that you know 50 people are going to be participating in mm -hmm. put on by a third party that we have hired out to do this does the select board really need to sit here and look at this infographic and decide taxation is four font sizes too small like i mean i respect great respect for why you would want to bring this to us for approval but i mean i don't need to see this like Put it out nothing in here is a lie nothing in here is inaccurate i mean every sentence on here is true you know it, we can argue and discuss and cut hairs yeah. about how true it is to however portion of the population is going to be but i just feel like the whole process of us needing to weigh in on this is, is just i mean it's unnecessary mm -hmm. 
This is the first in probably a series of documents Fair. that we'll be creating yeah. to share with the public. Thank you for reminding us to keep our eyes on the bigger picture. Um, I saw some hands in the audience. Um, unless board members have any other further comments, um, does anybody, let me put my other glasses on, does anybody have any questions or comments about the infographic? Would you state your, your name when you stand up? Thank you. Um, yeah, I've looked at the infographic. And yes, there's no lies. It's accurate. But it's also misleading. And I would also point out that um, somebody already has worked with the group on the text of this document. Um, so you start reading it, it says why merge, and it leads over to key benefits included. And right underneath it is a list of current benefits that have already been achieved. Uh, the cost savings from combining services. Those are not reasons to merge. Those are already savings that we've had. They are, in fact, reasons to not merge because clearly there can be cost savings had by not merging. It's demonstrated right here. So I would suggest that the current section, the currently activity sessions, would talk about things that we've already done. They're not part of what will be done if we merge. So I find that that section is a little bit misleading. It kind of implies that these are savings we will get as part of a merger. They're not. I went to two governance subcommittee meetings uh, where they talked primarily about things that are going to be on the focus group itinerary. And the primary amount of time spent in those two subcommittee meetings was talking about the two options that are going to be presented and how to couch the taxation issue. That was the bulk of the time. So to say that taxation is just one of the small items that needs to be in the lower left-hand corner, anybody you ask in town, what is merger all about? They're going to say taxes. So I think that's another misleading component. It should be equal footing with the three items above the, um, the circle. Finally, so I've been living in Essex now for 15 years. God, it's been so, so long. I didn't meet many of my neighbors for five years when I moved into my house. So we don't talk very much. We're not that plugged in. I've just sort of become a little bit conscious of the whole merger situation. And, I, and I've learned that in 2007, the town voted to not merge. So this is a rhetorical question. Don't expect an answer. Why are we still talking about merging? We voted no. Thank you. Thank you. Daryl, um, could you stand up and give sure. us your my full name? name? Is, my name is Daryl Stoltz. I live in, on Seneca Avenue in the Junction. And I also live in the town. Um, I don't know if my question is specific to the uh, infographic or more about the process altogether, which of course the infographic touches on. The uh, am I correct that the uh, governance subcommittee is preparing a plan to present to you and the trustees for your acceptance or approval? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Well, so, define plan. Yeah, define plan. Um, they are doing the research. And they will be. They do not have decision-making authority for any particular plans, so they okay. will be bringing their research to both boards, and the boards will make okay. the decision of what to do next. So they can't come to you and say they want somebody else to approve it. They have to get your approval and the trustees' approval. Yeah, you, you'll see where I'm going. Correct. Say. Okay. Um, so there's a village of Essex Junction. There's a town of Essex. There are people who live in the town outside the village, but there is no town outside the village, no municipality, no group that collects taxes, renders services, etc. cetera. Um, I pay taxes to the village, I pay taxes to the town, and I may participate in both of those processes. The idea has been floated that there needs to be a representational group for only the town outside the village to serve whatever their interests are, which nobody's really made clear yet. Uh, if we were to do that, to give representation, that, that would literally be giving representation without taxation. Uh, another idea that's been floated is to somehow rearrange the uh, trustees and the select board to make one board for the village and one board for the town outside the village, which would mean that I, as a village taxpayer, who also pays to the town, would 
I, w I would be taxed without representation to do that. That would be taken away from me, my ability to participate in the town part of that. Um, neither of those options are acceptable to me. Um, so I, I, if this is hopefully the right time, uh, I just want you guys to know that to, to please reject any any attempts to to do that. Okay. Make sense to I get it. What I'm, what yeah, I'm I understand. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Does anybody else have any comments, Irene? Sure. First, I'll address um, the topic that Dow brought up. Indeed, the people outside the village are recognized by the new merged school district. They have four representatives, and the village has four representatives elected from each district. There's a reason for that. Historically, for decades, and to this day. Many, many tax dollars have come from outside the village residents through a town-only highway tax. Just because appropriate representation has not been afforded to those people does not negate the millions of dollars collected from that special population under that tax. My comments about the infographic have to do with the first paragraph. If you could please scroll to the very top. Under first things first, there's a paragraph of two sentences. The second sentence says, town and village residents are all residents of the town. I understand that town equals town. It seems like a no-brainer, but I believe what you mean to say is that town outside the village residents plus village residents are town residents. Yes, they're all town residents, but to misuse the word town to mean something different at the beginning of that sentence than you do in the middle to mean is the culmination of the type of misleading information that Ken mentioned. Uh, when we are in local government, we are not allowed to be political and partial about issues like this that are going on ballot. And therefore, I would like to see, in addition to key benefits include, an equally sized box with an equal heading of key challenges include, key disadvantages include, or something like that that puts the pluses and minuses of a merger proposal out there for the people in the focus groups to equally assess what you're asking them to do. I don't think it's fair to anyone to just list benefits and not to have a corresponding section of the challenges and the disadvantages. And I'll stop with this. Thank you so much. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you for your comments, everyone. Do board members have any further questions or comments on the Infographic, Annie. I just want a reminder. Well, I'm glad to see that um, the previous merger attempts will be such a solid piece. I just want a reminder. First, there was a vote for yes. That's the correct. first vote, the original vote, was to merge. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Just checking. I'm good. Look like you're getting ready to. No. I, yeah, I guess I should say something. We have gotten in trouble before. Irene's right for not having balanced documentation, you know, having pluses and minuses listed. Um, you know, this, this could look like a sales job rather than a instructional job. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't have anything to offer to tell you what the, the you know, the negatives might be. Um, and, you know, to, to even, even though the, the intent of this is to be used for the focus groups and for a limited number of people, um, it will be out on the website so anybody can see it. Um, so I, I, I have some reservations about that. Yeah, I guess I just have some clarification that, that being completely open to this, I, I want like an actual like opinion. I don't really fall in one way or another, but as elected officials, with respect, Irene, I think that we are allowed to not only have opinions, but to put those forward and advocate for them. I mean, when Barack Obama was trying to pass his health care legislation, 
he and those of his elected political allies very much used what they had within their power to try to get legislation that they believed was a benefit passed. I mean, we as a select board, nothing prevents us from saying that we need to stay neutral in this process. Like we ourselves, we should not be using staff resources to do that. You know, like completely agreed in this case, but this is a document that KSV basically has produced. Oh, it's coming to us is no. Am I wrong about that? We, we are producing it for them, for the focus groups. We're producing it for them, for the focus groups. So, and be, go ahead. No, that's fine. I would just say that we absolutely do need to have our eyes open to the challenges of merger. We're not exactly sure what they are yet in specific enough detail to be able to say to people, if the choice is made, this is what's going to happen. Right, that's what the whole We thing. know there are going to be downsides, and we know there are going to be challenges, and we know that there's going to have to be compromises to achieve some sort of fair plan. But we don't know what those are yet, and the purpose of this document is to be a part of those focus groups where we will hear from the residents who say, what about this? What about that? This is going to affect me negatively. I don't want this to happen. This is going to affect my taxes. The whole point of this is to get those challenges. So I don't feel bad about having benefits on here because it's true. We do expect that these benefits are going to happen to some degree. And the fact that we have currently, what we have listed on here that we already do together is evidence that we have merged a lot of things already and it's already working really well. And so we would be remiss not to talk about that. But we definitely absolutely have to talk about the negatives when we can identify them specifically so that we are not encouraging the, the people here. Then we're already in a great conversation because I don't just want to know what I think about merger. I want to know what Irene thinks. I want to know what Ken thinks. I want to know what Daryl thinks. I want to know whatever in this depth of Irene, I appreciate your time, Ken, and yours, Daryl, then then we're already doing it right because the whole point of this is to get into the, the meat of it with the people in the focus groups. And if the people in the focus groups get stimulated in this way and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, this is not something we're handing out as here's what's happening because right. we're getting to that. So my, I, I yeah. am removing my <laughs> desire to change it and I appreciate the dialogue because I think this is what we're after anyway. Right. Perfect. Andy. In the survey that just completed, we had you know, 600 and some responses, and one of the open-ended questions in there was, uh, what is your vision for a merged community? And something like 47% of them came back and said, I don't know, you tell me what the choices are. And so I'm concerned that we're framing this to, you know, 47% of the people that responded don't have any thought about what, where things should go. And I think we're framing this too positively. We're, we're, not, we're only showing, a, you know, what we want people to see. We're not, we're not saying that, you know, I, I, think, I think we should just throw this whole thing away. I know it's a beautiful piece of work, but I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that it's, 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 it's putting a frame on something that isn't allowing an alternative viewpoint of, you know, what may be wrong with, the options we're, we're, we're when 47 percent of the respondents say i don't know you tell me and then we're telling this is what we're telling them i'm i'm concerned we we're, we're literally this we're literally doing the thing we're saying here's what we think and then you launch further discussion so the people said you tell me we are giving a framework and then we're asking you what else do what do you think what more do you think and what do you i'm sorry I thought I saw Pat's hand. Yeah, up. that's fine. Fine. Oh no, I was going to crack a joke. <laughs> please say, please but, do. I mean, I was going to be like, maybe we should have an accompanying document that has like the Monopoly man, like running away with a bag of money, like <laughs> towards the junction, from like Essex Town. You know, just kind of. I thought it was funny. I'm sorry, that was kind of in poor taste. <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. yeah. I, Andy. Um, there are other documents that are going to these focus groups that that aren't in front of us tonight. That have the three options laid out. That have that that have other information oh. that are important to 
having the discussion. I think this is a sales job. I'm, 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 I'm now I'm adamant against this, and I'm going to vote against it, against approval of it, because I, 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 I don't think we've given it fair consideration with regard to being unbiased, and we also unfortunately haven't. And, and I, it's occurred to me now, haven't shared the other documents that yeah. were prepared for this so that we can see this in context with those other things. It may be that the other things we prepared are enough and that this is is over-the-top sales. As a member of that committee, would you mind sharing with us the other documents that are going to be given to the focus group people that you've approved? I can try to pull them up. If, if I can just yeah. respond, this is in no way meant to be a sales job. Right. Uh, I, I know, this, but this it, it, it only has the, pluses. Doesn't have any. Uh, it's trying to capture the discussion that the boards have both had about mm -hmm. why you're doing this, what you thought the benefits were, why you're looking at doing this. I, I I understand if it comes across that way, we can try to adjust it. But I but I want to say strongly, yeah. staff is not trying to sell anything. Yeah, yeah I know. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, I apologize for that comment. You're, it, I, I, I don't. I'm not. I don't. I'm not accuse staff of doing anything underhanded. I'm just I'm just saying that I, I think that as a as a board here we need to do due due diligence and and make sure that we're not putting something on that's biased. Andy. Oh, excuse me. No, no, no. It's it's inform it's informative. People need to know that there were previous merger attempts. People need to know that Heart and Soul did all that work they did. People need to have like th these these are important things for people to know. Can, the community needs to learn these things. The, to, to trash this entire thing because of, it, it, there's so much information on here that's useful. People need to understand what it has been and what, the, and what it could be. And if you don't have these components available for people to even begin, you can't get friendly. Yes, it's, <laughs> yes, it's meant to be positive, not in a, any other way, but for, growth excuse my tonality andy i see this document as entirely uh information sharing when are things going to happen what are the things that are going to happen what happened in the past that's all i'm sorry evan i cut you off no no ma'am the the comment was should there be a key challenges box and so if you feel this is overly optimistic Maybe we take the comment um, and the sentiment, and somewhere in here we put some key challenges in here that have yet to be decided. I think the bottom line could e actually maybe right. be retitled. Just change that to we challenges. Have, we have challenges of taxation. We have challenges of identity. We have challenges um, in economic development, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe, you know, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, we take that as a challenge over the next couple of days and um, produce it. Now, we're not going to be able to bring it back to you uh, in time, but if that's the challenge, we accept and we'll, we'll update it. Suggestion. Would that be acceptable, yes. Andy? Yes. Yes. Andy? I'm, this woman's so smart, I'm so curious. Which, <laughs> oh, do board members have any other questions or comments? Thank you for pointing her out, Andy. Lisa. Hi, I just had a short question. I'll have to admit that I just looked at this on Irene's phone. But I've had some conversations about it, and a couple people approached me about the representation, and they felt that the proposal is um, biased in the merger and that there'll be more people from the village on the new governing committee, trustee, select board merger, than in the town outside the village. And I just looked at that. I don't see anything about that. And right. I was kind of doing some homework myself, and I looked into, like, the grand list, and they're pretty equal. Number of people, pretty equal by a little bit. And, you know, it's not big differences in, like, the taxes that I, well, that I found um, and the number of people that live outside the town and the village. It was kind of hard to find that info. But people had approached me and were really concerned about having more people from the village and less people from the town outside the village in part of the new governing. I didn't see that mentioned here. Um, as a, you know, it's, I think it's a big concern, and I think that really needs to be highlighted if that's the way it's going to be. Um, I saw Mr. Tech like shaking his head. It was really hard to get my numbers and look, but I went online and I looked at yeah. the town reports, and I was trying to compare them to like 
The residence is pretty accurate. I believe I got that from how many people live in each one. It's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And they're paying similar, you know, amount of money is coming in. So why isn't that number going to be equal? And, and that's been a concern from some, and I have to admit, I haven't read as much, but people have approached me and felt really concerned about that. And I don't see it on the infographic about how that's the fair representation. Everybody's represented. Thank you. Brian? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, let's get everybody out in the audience. Brian? Uh, hi. I mean, the select board has actually heard this pitch of mine before, but um, some of the people here haven't. Um, uh, when I lived in Austin in 2012, um, there, w there was a similar problem. Everybody, all the town city council members lived all right downtown. And it's like 27 miles wide, Austin is. So it was a referendum to create um, 10 single member districts. They put it on the ballot and it passed. One of the reasons it passed, and I hope that the board will consider this when we talk about wards going forward, was that there were, um, was that there was an independent uh, commission to draw the, to draw the districts. Um, so you guys know that I support that and I hope that we'll go forward with it. Um, one of the, um, the, another part of the proposal I made, you know, in January, I think, was that um, you, uh, Irene posted something on Essex, Vermont, about this, uh, this uh, very famously gerrymandered district in uh, Chicago, shaped like a C. The reason that's shaped like a C is because of the Voting Rights Act. They had to put that district together um, to, to keep a, to keep a, a Hispanic majority district. That's why it's shaped funny, because the Eisenhower Trustway goes through the middle. So I think what, if we want, I don't, um, if the goal here is merger and trying to bring this town together, um, I propose that the districts, the ward lines, straddle the current village boundary, because if we're gonna get rid of it, we shouldn't encode it into law going forward. That way, um, representation, um, uh, representatives of um, any of the you know, five or however many wards they are, will be forced to be responsive to people from the westward border all the way to Pearl Street, you know, that kind of thing. So that's it. That's my opinion. My Thank you. Daryl? Uh, I'm a bit confused about what the, the, the measurement of balance, because I see a select board here that represents the whole town, mm -hmm. and there are three people in the village and three pe or two people outside the village. That's pretty much as close as you can get to an even split, right? You can't have two and a half people from each. It, people seem to want to lump in the village five, right? But the village is the village, and the trustees represent me as a taxpayer to the village. They do not represent me as a taxpayer to the town. That's what you guys do. So it all looks very even to me. Thanks. Greg, you had, oh, uh, Margaret and then Irene. Well, I'm just gonna reply to that again. I've, I've lived in the town outside the village, pardon me for not standing up. That's okay. Um, for, since 1974 and I've never gotten to vote on anything that the village does. It it's just doesn't, and the village people, on the other hand, have always gotten to vote on what the town does. So that, to me, doesn't seem like equal representation. Um, and, and I just have a point of order. Does anybody besides me remember? I think there was a, a, a merger vote before 2000. There was another, at least one more attempt. There have been... Yeah, Dozens. It's, it's not just, just <laughs> over the years. Two. This I, has been I a decades like long. Four. This is so. a decades long thing. Yeah. Irene. Um, as you know, I think merger is a bit of a misnomer because we already are merged. The town outside the village and the town inside the village have a number of functions that are run by the select board, budgeted for and run out of this building, and the village does its own thing on certain functions, and that's perfectly fine, and when the village wants to change, that's great. The future of the entire town of Essex should be determined by the select board alone. We do elect all of you to determine that future and to run those town-wide functions. To have joint meetings regularly with the trustees and to be talking about merger with them is objectionable to quite a few people who live outside the village because the entire town's future is being decided by 10 people, eight of whom live in the village. And that is where it has become crystal clear to many people that representation is not equitable. It's not equitable, and it is nowhere near the example that the merged school district has set for us by having four people from the village and four people from outside the village, and that's working along just fine. Thanks. Thank you. Daryl, one Sorry, more time. One real quick thing. 
as long as I'm writing checks to two different municipalities, we are not merged. You get the representation you pay for. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Greg, you had, uh, Greg's been having his hand up for quite some time. Uh, just quickly, I'll show you the, the infographics that the governance subcommittee approved on Friday for um, quick, quick, easy to see stuff for the focus groups. Um, the different governance options, options one, two, and three. Uh, option one with one municipality, one governing body, one tax rate. Option two, one municipality with one governing body and a special tax rate for specific services, so different tax rates. Um, status quo is what we have right now. We have the uh, two governing bodies, the select board and the trustees with two different tax rates. Um, representation options, these are what's being considered. Um, this is the pop latest population estimate as of 2018. It's, it's really close, 10,982 to 10,000. 929 inside and outside the village. Um, looking at the representation options, uh, one is to just do at-large elections. Another one is to have two wards. And another one is to have two wards with at-large representation. There is a, there's some fine print on there. Just want to point out that it says that this is only an example. There could be more than two wards. Yep. Get to your point. Uh, lastly, still going to correct um, double check on a couple of these rates here so this one's not quite finalized but it shows the different tax rates um, with the status quo mm -hmm. and then right here we basically have the same stuff but it's um, bullet point form as opposed to graphical form graphic infographic form can I ask that all board members receive a copy of all of these documents Absolutely. thank you mm -hmm. I should have included that in the packet so. Annie, did, did Annie, did you have a question? You had your hand up. Yes. It's not really a question. It's more I would like to help. I forget her name. Cheryl? No, behind Daryl. Margaret. Margaret. Understand. This is the third meeting where I have felt that we have not helped Margaret understand something. Go right ahead. Greg, if you could do me a favor and put up the first of the three graphics. Margaret, am I correct that your grandchildren live inside the village? They don't. No, they don't live. They live in the same They moved to Jericho. Uh, so, so it's not an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm right. sorry. <laughs> I got confused for a second. So, and please someone stop me. Cool. Well, not yet. <laughs> if I'm wrong. Sure. Uh, Margaret, uh, more than once I've heard you ask a question about, and Irene can help me if I get this wrong, please. The village is inside the town. And so those who live in the village pay taxes that are to the town in its entirety, but also only to the village. So when they vote on things only within the village, such as EJRP, the town, which is located outside the village, cannot vote on that because those who live in the town outside the village don't pay the taxes that the, those inside the village pay. So maybe I would have liked to vote on it so we could get those services, but it was never an option. It was, it was just never an option. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope that I'm not being never rude to you. I thought I would be oh, helpful. I know that. I know I thought all I that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I know if all I that rude. already. My apologies. But thank you for. Well, I appreciate you not getting frustrated with me. Yeah. I'm going to take one more comment from Ken and Irene, and then we need to wrap this up. Ken? So look at this graphic. What word do you see that's most commonly repeated? All three options contain the word tax. If I was to make a word cloud of the topics that go about when it comes to merger, the three biggest words would be taxes, taxes, and taxes. Why you folks seem to be oblivious to that fact, everybody talks about it. Why is it in the lower left-hand corner on that infographic? It should be right up on top. It is the biggest thing that will change that most people care about. We don't know how it's gonna change, I'll give you that. Most people kind of have a feeling though how it's gonna change. You take X and Y, people are paying X plus Y, all of a sudden Y goes away and it's spread amongst a larger group. I know my algebra. I think people have a sense as to where that's going. 
don't mention it. It doesn't need to be mentioned, but taxes are the primary driving force behind this merger. Everybody thinks it may not be true. Everybody thinks it, and your documentation shows it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Annie just mentioned on this that there's a town outside the village and a village. So I'd like to go back to those two pie charts, Greg, if we could, that are orange and blue. On the left-hand side, I believe it says town tax rate, and someone like Daryl could be very confused because he does pay taxes to the town, but this pie chart, I believe, only shows the town outside the village tax scenario. And if that's true, could we please say TOV tax rate to show that whether you live in the town inside the village, it says outside, outside the village, the village right one there. One of those graphics. It okay. says it right on there, I mean. Then it's because I'm so far away that I can't see it. This should say outside. Thank you. It does. Great. Okay. I just want to make sure that change yeah, came yeah, out. Yeah, we fixed that. We, we, and Thank we fixed you. that. And yeah. it was thanks to Irene's comment, so we appreciate it. I, I just never got confirmation uh, of that meaning that it was going to change. Sure. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. So staff has asked us to recommend the use of this infographic during the um, focus groups. So um, unless there's further discussion, I think we should go ahead and vote on whether we want them to do that. Would anyone like to make a motion based on the recommendation in our packet? Oh, Greg, sorry. If you are going to make a motion, I would ask that it um, mention what the edits discussed tonight. And not as amended? You want it specifically with the edits? Uh, as amended. Would anybody like to make that motion? I would like to try my best. I move that we. Oh no, I'm not gonna. I'm scared. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna motion. Make a motion on this. Thing. I'll make it. Uh, I move that the select board uh, authorize the use of this infographic, Greater Essex 2020, answering your questions about the November 2020 merger vote as amended during the focus groups about governance change. I will second. Any seconds? Any further discussion? Um, I'm going to vote yes on this because, again, I think that it's just it's not something that we, as a select board, really needed to kind of approve and see anyway. Um, I am. I did, wasn't aware that this was something generated by staff. I actually did think that it was a KSV generated thing. So you know, it, it's just it, 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 not. I don't think there's anything underhanded. I just wasn't aware of it. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because I had you know, sort of gone on that discussion before. I, I probably would have preferred if KSV had been the people responsible for generating this since we're paying them that. But, you know, I don't think that this is large of enough of an issue to negate clearly what is a ton of work and is going to be utilized to provide information to a small sect of people. Well, keep in mind that any client KSV has has to provide them with the information necessary to do their job. Yeah, and I'm assuming that That's we should be is. giving. Okay. Yeah. We have a motion on the table and a second. Can I clarify one more Greg? thing too? This is going to, if, if this gets approved, mm -hmm. it'll go towards the focus groups, but it most likely would be used after the focus groups as yeah. well as informational materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Okay. There is a motion and a second on the table. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, it passes three to one. Thank you. And this will go to the focus group participants, as amended. So earlier in the meeting, I asked if we could adjust the agenda to pull something out of the reading file and bring it up for discussion as a business item. So we'll do that at this time. Um, the memo from Greg regarding public hearing for grant application for recovery housing at Fort Ethan Allen. This is item 7E. We're going to open up and discuss as item 5G. Greg, would you mind giving us the background, please? Sure. Um, so Champlain Housing Trust approached the town a few weeks ago. Um, if you give me a second, I'm just trying to pull up the, the information. it was 
was in the reading file. It's in the bottom. Yeah, me too. I'm, yeah. I want Command F on my. I open them as individual files so I don't have to scroll. Oh, Andy. Okay. Um, so Champlain Housing Trust approached the town a few weeks ago about um, going after a grant application through the Vermont Community Development Program, BCDP, to convert some of uh, Champlain Housing Trust's apartments, uh, apartment buildings in 40th and Allen to recovery housing. Um, staff is still looking into it. I, I wanted to put it on the reading file today to give you a chance to start to digest it. Their grant application is due uh, early September, so August 19th is kind of the one time they could have a public hearing about it. If you've not had a chance to see this, um, so staff, I made the decision to, to warn the public hearing um, so you can be able to consider it and, and give consideration to the project. Staff, in the meantime, is still working on information about what it means in terms of the town's commitment if the town was to sign off on this grant. Basically, the um, the VCDP grants uh, need to be applied for and given to municipalities, so the town of Essex would basically act as a pass-through in this case, um, would get the money, give it to Champlain Housing Trust to allow them to, to make the conversion and work with the uh, Vermont Recovery Program, I forget the exact name of the organization. Foundation of Foundation Recovery. Foundation, thank you. Vermont Foundation for Recovery. Um, so this is what it is. I, I can try to answer. I, I know a little bit more information at this point, but we're still gathering more information that we'll have for you on the 19th. Did any of you have questions about this project, this grant application? Andy? Um. And mostly about the, the, the public hearing, it has a, a location specified in it, but I think we have a shooting ordinance hearing that night as well. Um, so I assume we'll, we'll deal with with that. We're not going to have it in this room. Good confirmation this morning that or this afternoon that we'll have the hearing at the high school and we will put notices up on the door. Yep. Okay. Do we expect a lot of people to show up for this topic? I don't know. Um, Champlain Housing Trust is having an information meeting for the residents this coming Friday. Yep, August 9th. Okay, um, they're doing they're their own, doing their own. They're right? doing their oh, own. Um, right. They're have, doing that at St. Right. Mike's. We have Thank gotten you. community yeah. development has gotten at least one phone call about this, so there is some interest. I, I wouldn't surprise me if there's five or ten people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, have we gotten any input from the fire chief or the chief of police on this particular? Project? Not yet. That's some of the information yeah. we're trying to get. I'm, I'm scrolling through this. Is this a pro? Is this grant through VHCB or is it through the Community Development Program that the Agency of Commerce and Community Development administers? I can't really tell. I will have to check on that. The reason I ask is because. If it's from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, I can't vote on it because I work for them. So I would just don't want to have anything to do with that. And do you as, do, do you feel that you have all the information you need from CHT to let we, us apply for this grant? Or there's you still have questions? Yeah, we we have a meeting. Staff has a meeting with Champlain Housing Trust this Wednesday trying to pull together some information, um, get input from the fire chief, the police chief, mm -hmm. town plan, our finance department, because this is a 30-year commitment for the yeah. town to track it. Um, so those are a lot of the questions we have. And the information we'll be working to have for before the 19th. Because sometimes we could be a pass-through for something, but then the organization that holds the grant does everything. Yeah. But this, you know, I would love to know if our staff has to be doing grant management. Well. That would be a good question. A lot of times they also require an audit, um, a single audit or something like that. So it depends on whether it's annual, every five years or whatever. Uh, usually we do that. This is a, so as Greg was mentioning earlier, it's one thing if they have the right to do it because of zoning. The property is zoned appropriately. They do it, and and we 
are a pass through because we're the municipality. This is actually, uh, but they're asking us to be their sponsor for this, which implies that we're in favor of doing this. So we wanted to bring that to the select board's attention. It's not just the same that these units, uh, they own the buildings already. They want to renovate the units and then change the type of, of recover, uh, the type of activity that's occurring within them. Um, so we want to bring that to attention. The uh, lady from uh, is coming in two weeks. So again, we don't know if the public will come there to this meeting, uh, but they are going to be on a tight timeline. It is not the type of thing that it's sort of just perfunctory. Mm. Um, so we wanted to bring it to your attention. And then over, say, the next week or so, if you get a chance maybe to dive deeper and you have some questions, we'd love to get those questions in advance and have this uh, entity prepared to be able to answer. I have a couple more questions. Um, could you pr provide us in the materials for the next meeting when we have the hearing, could you provide us with a section of the town plan that um, addresses this kind of housing so that we're fully aware of what we are accounting for in our planning? And if the housing study that was just completed has anything to do with recovery housing, could you include that information? Mm -hmm. And then when CHT does their um, resident meeting where they talk to the residents about in the area about their thoughts, mm -hmm. I'd love to get the minutes to that or at least their mm -hmm. notes from that because we want to know yeah. what the residents in that neighborhood are thinking about this mm -hmm. project. So thank you. Annie. Yeah, I feel a little dopey asking this. Mm. Well, what, you just said it was, they own the buildings and they're changing what their use is. What has the use been? Is that already in here? I did not read thoroughly. I'm not sure if it's in here, but they, basically Champlain Housing Trust took over, I want to say it was like 32 units um, in 40th and Allen from, there was former UVM housing. When? About two years ago. Thank you, sorry to be so aggressive. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, of those units, roughly half of them, not exactly half, but roughly half were converted to uh, condo ownership units um, right. for affordable housing right. through the affordable housing program. Right. These other units were originally conceived of as affordable rental units. Um, I think they've been used as such to this point, but there's no deed restrictions. Like a lot of the times you'll have oh. rental units that are affordable in perpetuity or for 30 years. They don't have those restrictions on them, which is why they are considering this conversion to the recovery housing. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns, Pat? I mean, just comment. I mean, obviously, I'd, I'd love to hear what the police and fire chief have to say around it, but I mean, it seems like this would be a way for us to you know, walk the talk about mm -hmm. helping deal with the opiate crisis mm -hmm. and addiction yeah. recovery, and if we can provide a a safe place for people who are trying to get their lives together after, yeah. you know, traumatic event like that. Then I'm 100% behind it. From what I understand, this would be the first um, recovery housing in the area for families, not just individuals who are doing recovery away from their families. So it's a big deal. Annie. Uh, Patrick made me think maybe we can invite Riley Allen, the young filmmaker that created the recent film about families in crisis mm. she probably has a lot to say or I don't know too silly She'd be welcome to come to the hearing Great. I mean yeah okay um, so that was not a decision point for us I just wanted us to have a more robust discussion than leaving it in the reading file so yeah. thank you for allowing me to bring it forward if there aren't any other questions or comments on that we're good okay we're good um, let's move on to the consent agenda. So at this point, um, if you don't mind, Evan, still, if you any comments on the reading file, we just sort of pulled one out. Is there anything? You well, ask we'll get we'll get to the reading file after we oh. do the consent. Oh, consent. Agenda. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So with the consent agenda, what we usually do is I will I'm going to ask, does anybody have anything in the consent agenda that they want to pull out and discuss separately to vote on separately? And it looks like Andy does. I'd like to make a change to the minutes of July 23. Okay. 
So let's vote to pull those minutes out of the consent agenda and vote on them separately. Can I have a motion for that? I move that we amend the agenda to pull out the uh, July 23, 2019 select board minutes uh, for uh, correction and approval. Is there a second? Uh, second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 So, Andy, what would you like to do about those minutes? So, line 255 uh, says the original motion passed 5 to 0. I voted nay on that motion, so you should say that the motion passed 4 to 1 with Andrew Watts dissenting. Oh, you have the wrong minutes. 255, you said? Line 255, yeah. Okay. That's a significant change. So, were there any other corrections you wanted to make to those minutes, Andy? That was it. Anybody else want to change those minutes? Okay, so can I get a motion to approve the minutes as amended? I, will, uh, I make a motion to uh, approve the amended minutes. Thank you, Andy. Andy? <laughs> I do it every time. Can there be a second? Second. All those in favor of amending the July 23rd minutes? As of accepting the July 23rd minutes as amended, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so the rest of the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Andy? I move I move approval of the consent agenda with select board member comments. Second. Second. Further discussion. Seeing none. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Now we are on the reading file. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or observations from the select board? And then we can talk about the reading file in general. It's a quiet evening all of a sudden. <laughs> well. Oh, I brought blueberries if anybody wants blueberries. <laughs> I picked them this afternoon. From his from house. My backyard. <laughs> it's so nice. Didn't have to wrestle the bear this time? No bear, oh. there's no bear out there today. No. Evan, you sounded like you had something oh, to I say. I just about wanted to make sure that we got to the any comments of the reading file of anything else. So I was out, I was the one who got confused that we hadn't done consent yet. Okay. Andy. Sorry, I did want to say thank you for including the thank you notes from the agencies that we funded mm -hmm. with our human services. So. <laughs> yeah. It is nice that they sent us thank yous. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's really um, great. And it is us that are thanking them as well for the work that they're doing mm -hmm. for our community at large. Um, yeah. Anything else about the reading file? Uh, any, uh, oh, Lisa? Uh, just, um, this is the reading file about the new policy for the... Yes, that is included in there. It, there's some informational material in here. There's not a new policy in here, just so you know. Right, it's, it's background information. We haven't done the new policy yet. Am I still allowed to keep Absolutely. That? I just want to make sure you, you didn't think there was an actual new policy in here. There is Thank not. You, okay. So, I know you're voting on it down the road. Um, so, and I'm here to come in here and speaking to you, so I appreciate you letting me know some of the protocol. I have a couple of things um, that I want to say. First, um, I like to say, um, this Vermont statutes online highway policy. Um, I think it's always interesting when you take it out of context and what it was really for and the road classification of class four roads um, driven by the ancient road policy to take roads that weren't developed and to reclassify them. Not necessarily to develop roads and keep them a class four road. I think somewhere towns saw this as a way to save money, but it creates a lot of problems because towns are still responsible for safety and all the other things that go with it. And it wasn't the intent of the law and the classification to say, oh, we're just gonna make this class four road, we can develop it, collect money and not do anything. On that note, um, I have a couple of, of things that I have questions about in terms of in the um, memorandum for the new policy. Um, one, I'm gonna go to Let's see, is it two? It's C. I've got a couple. Um, 
expectation is that adjacent landowners with developed lots would actively maintain the road through grading and gravel additions. Excuse me, Lisa, where are you? I'm on page, this is the, I just have a memorandum. I'm not sure what you have, but it's 2C. Seven B and C. I I think we're in seven B, but am I incorrect? Are there attachment four? Um. Oh, with uh, with all of the documents that you have. We're in seven B. I don't know four. which one I copied. Oh, okay. So the page memorandum. fourteen of section seven B. Of Thank our you for helping Look find that. The expectation is adjacent landowners with developed lots active with developed lots actively maintain the road surface. So I have some challenges with the word with developed lots. It's public road and even the, the new private road ruling that the state when a number of people live on a private road, everyone's responsible equitably, even undeveloped lots for contributing. And this kind of excludes anyone with a developed lot, undeveloped lot from not participating and, and it's actually a public road so I don't think like how much I drive on it really matters because there's a park at the end of it mm -hmm. so like um, that there's gonna be lots of traffic that has nothing to do with me or anyone that lives on the road and so um, I have an issue with that language in there also the town has 600 foot of frontage that they haven't developed on the road so that becomes a conundrum of does the person have to maintain town road and their ditches and your road? Is that like a allowed? I mean, I don't know, but I would think there'd be a problem with saying the landowner next to the town property has to maintain the town property and ditches. And there's nothing in here about that. So that's a second piece that I'd like you to consider when you're reading this. Um, the other, I have um, 3B, the standard for maintenance shall be that the required in the town adopted state road bridge standards. I know what those are, I'm okay with that. But the town public works construction specifications for gravel roads, I'm a little confused about that. It's a class four road, town doesn't have to maintain it. What standards? I'd like this to be very specific. There are 20 years of errors causing so many issues with what is res responsible just the other day, the town sent me an email telling me it was a private road, okay? I think we have to be really clear what standards, which one it is, and cite all of those in this for us to accept this because it gets changed later on um, or interpreted differently. And so the interpretation needs to be clear for everyone that lives on the road. Um, <clears throat> there's also a question of the current state of the road. It's failed the erosion control. It's not at all standards. It doesn't meet the standards because so many people on the road don't contribute. And it's been funded maybe 50% of what it needs to be. I think town records say it's about $9,000 to do grading, bring road in. And only half the road's been paying and they're paying about $4,000, okay? Because I haven't been paying eight, the neighbor a share. Which means after many years, 20, it's not at the state it was when it was built. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done on it. So when you say this new policy and you're enforcing it, it's sort of like, gee, I already paid my 30,000. Do I have to now upgrade it again question? So I'd really like clarity on that statement of the expectation um, for everyone that's on the road. I also think this policy doesn't talk about money that's being collected right now. Um, the town is actually collecting a $400 road fee for maintenance for someone's frontage. Now, the, the development says subdivisions are required to um, pay a fee. We have an association for part of the road. Um, some of that wasn't legal, wasn't done really well 20 years ago, and it's left part of this problem today. Um, but I think that's, that's, a, that's an issue, is what's the town gonna do? Are they gonna keep collecting money from these new developments? Um, is that what they're gonna do? And what are they gonna do with the money that they have? Um, so I have some questions about that in terms of this new policy and restating the statement. Um, I know this is part of the, yes? Is there a question for me? Yeah, sorry, I, can you remind me? I know you said up front where the area you're talking about. Do, West do Sleepy Hollow Road. Thank you. Which is a class four road. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Yeah, yeah. And I think what happens with the problem here is there's 
17, somebody just told me he's bought another lot, 18 houses, families on the road. That's a lot for a class four road. Um, other class four roads in town don't have residents, so it's not as much of a big deal, I don't think. Um, but the fact that there's a public property at the end and there, it isn't a no parking road, people park in this road, they do go and use that, they don't park in the end. But so there's public transportation going down this road that we end up paying for them. It's kind of a weird situation. I also um, have two questions about the town ordinances. In that policy, it references a couple of times the town ordinances. So I'm going to read you a couple of town ordinances. Not the one you cite, but the other one. The town does not encourage residential or commercial construction utilizing Class 4 highway as primary access as such development leads to scattered growth, burdens on municipal services, and access problems for school buses, fire trucks, and other emergency vehicles. Accordingly, it is the policy of the town to prohibit development on Class 4 highways until they are upgraded by other interested parties to the Public Works Department highway specifications. That's 20 years old and the town has never honored that. At the time this was written, there was one house on the road. They have not upgraded the road to where it needs to be. They've not collected the monies. There's been lots of clerical errors. So now we are 20 years later. And this is an ordinance that's already certified. So when we cite an ordinance in the writing, I want to know which ordinance because we're clearly not talking about this one. Um, there's another one. Class 4 town highways, which have continuous right of way from class 3 or higher class road to another class 3, may exceed the 900 feet. So there's conflicting ordinances here, which actually, I don't know how many of you have been on the select board for very long, but these were brought to the select board's attention, I think 15 years ago, by the town attorney, um, that they were conflicting ordinances, and the town has just chosen not to resolve that and continues to develop the road. Um, we've asked that the town not honor that ordinance and not continue to allow development. They've done a really, I'm sorry for you, but it's done a really poor job in terms of managing the road, collecting the monies equitably. There's a neighbor who paid $12,000 in upgrade fees, there's someone else paid thirty, dollars and I gotta tell you, their final plans came in a year later. I have no idea, it doesn't make any sense to me. And then there's the Sweetser residence where it just got left out of the documentation. So he didn't have to contribute to making the road better. Um, and so that's a real problem. What everyone on the road in the West Sleepy Hollow Road Association, we've contributed, we've been doing our best. And I gotta tell you, I don't know a darn thing about roads. I've had to learn about roads and permits and all of this. So asking an individual, and the other guy was a dentist, or you know, to maintain a public road with 17 homes on it, that's pretty challenging. And I think we've done a pretty kick-ass job over the years with everyone make, doing their best, trying to figure out what do you gotta do to make the road better. Because um, I've had to learn a lot. I've gotten down my knees and checked every culvert, which is where we discovered one of those was eroded, and looked at them and go, what's going on with this? Um, there's a lot of maintenance. And now we have the erosion and this bridge um, the town of Bridge and the uh, water development that's um, stormwater <coughs> permit. So I want you to um, think about that. Also, um, each lot, another, no, that's, sorry, wrong document. I have a question for the select board. I have a copy of the Karen and Emery Bassett final approval plan. And it states, um, that there is impact money given. At the time of the issuance of the zoning permits, the applicant will pay an impact fee for road improvements along the frontage of the lots, the four lots, including widening the road, laying three inches of gravel on the road. It's not a fee directly for paving the road. It's a fee for adding that gravel for the four new lots for their lots. But the town has collected that money and now says they won't spend the money, they're gonna keep it. They'll do what they want with it. They've already spent it. They don't work with the road association. They say they do, but they put four loads of giant trucks up there and they had a grader up there and we didn't know about it until after it happened, okay? That was only part of this woman's money. All of the money that she pays in this plan was for her lot, not for anybody else's. And so I want, in this new policy, I would like some clarity about 
all these old errors, mistakes, what are you gonna do with that money? And how's that gonna be managed? We don't want the road paved. We would rather have money just to make it a good class three road. We don't want the town to take it over. We like living on a dirt road. We want everyone to contribute. That's the idea. But we also don't want people having their money taken that they've contributed to their plan, even though it's old, says it goes to their lot being used for other things by the town. I don't think that's right. I really don't. I've also reached out to the police department to ask about the safety. How can he approve the safety for building more houses on the road when it's not wide enough? It doesn't have enough gravel. Culvert in front of my house is ready to collapse and yet says that house is road safe enough for more traffic and it isn't. He won't reply. He won't tell me what his safety standards are. So I looked him up and I found them. He still doesn't answer and it's not safe and it doesn't meet the requirements and the turnaround doesn't. So you have the other ordinance that says no more development, no more houses. We can't, we can't, we can't have it. And so I'm really concerned about this restatement um, because it's missing a lot of parts. And so as you read this document, I'd really like you to consider that, that when someone buys this house on the road, they have an expectation. This is from Mr. Nye. I'm gonna quote Mr. Nye, he was on the select board many years ago. They have an expectation of having services. It's a public road, that it's, that there's a lot of houses that the fire truck can get up there, emergency vehicles can get up there. And that if that's not the case, they have an expectation to know that. And I think that also hasn't happened. I bought my house two years ago. I didn't know that. It's not easy to know that. So those are some things we'd like you to consider. I come as myself, a new neighbor, but also for the association, because I know they couldn't all make it tonight, um, but to share that information with you. And to be looking at all of the ordinances okay. when we're citing them, not just one, because okay. there's a bunch of others that say you shouldn't be developing and we have to be thinking about the road safety and what's happened in the past. There's been a lot of mistakes, not easy to fix it, but let's not make it worse. Your frustration with the process is really evident. We, I really appreciate your taking the time to share in such detail what you've been trying to work on. So this sounds like something that we should look into a little bit. We'll get as much information as we can, and I appreciate your sharing with and, us. You know, the last thing is to think about the Constitution. Pardon me? The Constitution. Mm. Okay. It's clause number seven. When you start asking the neighbor to pay for the maintenance on the road that's owned by the town, or one neighbor to pay for public road and another not to, you're getting really scarily into lawsuits. We don't want to sue you, okay? Okay. But we want you to be thinking about doing this the right way so that it's fair for everybody. Okay. Thank right. you very so much. For, about that. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Okay, I think that we were still on the reading file. Did anyone else have any more questions or comments? We are not in need of an executive session because we took care of that business earlier in the meeting. So at this point, I think we are ready to adjourn, if you are. Would anyone like to move to adjourn? Going once. I make a motion that we adjourn. I have a second, please. A second. All in favor of adjourning, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.